please welcome Brian Osborne. All right. Well, thank you, George. I do hope it resonates with everybody. If you watch the show Till Shift, you'll get that. If not, don't worry about it. But uh, good to see you again. Everybody have a good lunch. Very good. Awesome. Now you ready to go to sleep? <laughs> you are supposed, don't be that affirming. No, that's a no. <laughs> All right, well, we are going to talk about Noah's Ark and Flood and have a, hopefully some really a good time looking at a lot of really good answers on that. Before we do, I must show you my greatest earthly blessings by far. There they are. That's my wife, Marla, of 25 years this past June. I praise the Lord. Yeah, amen. It has been wonderful. Looking forward to 25 more, God willing. And then my daughter, Macy, who is six. My son, Ian, who is 10. And I'm just showing off my greatest earthly blessings. The first 20 minutes of this presentation is just pictures. <laughs> Take it in. Enjoy it. All right. But uh, I will stop there. And, of course, as you already know from Ken's talk and kind of who we are, our focus as a ministry is to defend biblical authority, to proclaim the gospel effectively. And that is our passion. We're not simply giving answers. We're not simply passing on answers to kids. We want to give answers to show them the Bible's true. It's right about everything, history, morality, identity, sexuality, salvation found in Christ, in Christ alone. It's right about everything. Put your faith in Christ. And so we're going to focus in this session on the third seed, the catastrophe of Noah's day, and how really what we see in God's world confirms what we read in God's word in a very clear way. And actually, if we stand on God's word, we got answers. And there are lots of questions about Noah's ark and flood. And, and kids ask some of the best questions, of course, about these sorts of things, but also many other people, believers, non-believers alike. And so if we'll stand on God's word, an amazing thing happens. We have answers. And so that's what we're going to do during the session. We're going to cover a whole bunch of questions, kind of rapid fire style about Noah's Ark and floods. So let's just dive right in and deal with the first question. A very often asked question, how did Noah get all those animals onto the ark? And atheists ask this like a mic drop. But, of course, if you just trust God's word, the answer really isn't that hard. First, the Bible tells us that the ark was a really big ship. Looking something like that. Of course, you've seen the ark over that way, the uh, replica of it. But friends, this was not Noah's ark. All right. Let's banish that picture from the minds of our kids, from our books, from our Sunday school classrooms. They're presented in that biblical fashion, over 500 feet long, 85 feet wide, 51 feet tall, with three different levels. Literally a floating warehouse, as you've seen going to the ark down there. Dimensions for the most part equal to a modern day cargo ship, really big, which gave a good balance of strength and, com and comfort and stability that you would need during Noah's flood. Capacity equaled almost 500 semi-trailer trucks. So it's a really big ship. But was it big enough? How many animals did Noah take on the ark? Well, the Bible's clear that God brought to Noah only the land-dwelling, air-breathing animals to go on the ark. There were no sea creatures, there were no fish, on the ark. There was a lot of water outside the boat for those things, all right? And the most likely God brought to Noah young adults for many good practical reasons. And maybe the biggest issue of all where people kind of miss the boat on this is that God brought to Noah two of each kind, not two of each species, two of each kind. And the word kind in the Bible for the most part, it's equal to about the family level of modern day classification. So what that means practically is this. Noah did not take 400 pairs of dogs on the ark. He most likely never saw a chihuahua or a poodle in his life. <laughs> he was a blessed man. <laughs> no. He just took two of the dog kind, two of the elephant kind, two of the cat kind, two of the major kinds of animals. And how many were there? How many kinds of no need to account for all the variations we see today and the extinct variations in the fossil record? Well, friends, we've done a ton of research on this. And in a worst case scenario, he needed no more than 1,400 total kinds multiplied by two, of course. You may do seven or 14 of the clean. And in that worst case scenario, Noah needed no more than 6,700 individual animals on that massive boat. Now, that's a worst-case scenario, but that number fits with no problem on that massive ship. 
Now, does that number include dinosaurs? The answer is not no, all right? But that's a different talk for a different time. But no problem getting the animals onto the ark. So answer that one. But let's move on to some other questions. And let's really attach the, the event in the Bible to what we see in the world around us. If there was a global flood as described in God's word, what would be the effects we'd expect to see in the world around us today? And it's interesting. When you go to Genesis 6, 13, God told Noah the purpose of the flood. To, yes, to destroy both them, the people, but note the second part, and the earth. Part of the purpose of the flood was to wreck this world. We see the effects of it in multiple ways. And it's interesting. Before the flood, people lived on average over 900 years. What do you do for 900 years? Man, I don't know. That is a long time. But pretty much most cultures have legends of when the people used to live to be close to 1,000 years of age, rooted in the real history found in, we find in God's word. But then your red line is the flood line. After the flood, people are not living near as long. Those lifespans drop off really quickly to 400, 200, to just 100 years of age like is average today at best. Why the rapid decrease? Well, it's safe to assume that genetic bottleneck played a big role, if not the primary role in this reduction, but also safe to assume that God accomplished his promise of wrecking this world. The flood wrecked the earth. Post-flood, it's a wrecked world, wrecked environment, wrecked climate. Things don't live as long, in some cases don't grow as big as their pre-flood counterparts. So the question is, well, what happened during the flood to wreck the world in such a catastrophic way? Well, we get some clues from the word of God. Go to Genesis 7, verses 11 and 12. This is the start of the flood. And it says that on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth. And the floodgates gates of the heavens were opened and the rain fell 40 days and 40 nights. And of course, we're all familiar, if you grew up in church at all, about the 40 days and nights of rain and stuff like that. But springs of the great deep bursting forth, what is that talking about? Well, according to the original Hebrew language, that seems to imply subterranean water, water underneath the crust of the earth. And the Hebrew verb, therefore, burst forth, means to break through, crack, and move catastrophically. So water underneath the earth's crust burst forth through the earth's crust and move that crust in catastrophic ways all across the globe, all at the same time, at least in, in regards to that event. And think about what happens today when we move the earth's crust just a little bit. What do we get? Man, earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic activity, right? Some of you might remember this event from around almost 13 years ago now, hard to believe. But over in Japan, there was this massive tsunami that caused a lot of devastation in Japan. Do you know what happened, tectonically speaking, to cause that tsunami, to cause that much damage? There were two tectonic plates against each other like this off the coast of Japan in the shallow ocean waters. Here's what happened that caused that tsunami that caused that much damage. You ready? Watch closely. Did you see it? That's all that happened. One plate nudged or slid against another plate. And from that slip or that nudged, it caused that tsunami that caused that much damage. If that's what happens when you just nudge those plates, what happens when you break them open and move them catastrophically all across the world all at the same time? Friends, you'll get earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic activity on a scale we cannot begin to fathom. It would be enough to destroy the world. Sounds like Genesis 6, 13, doesn't it? Wrecking this world in a catastrophic way. So the mechanism for the flood was absolutely globally catastrophic, but also the duration is something we tend to miss about the flood as well. The Bible tells us that the waters flooded. They increased for 150 days and they receded for 150 days. So for 300 days, these waters covered the earth, moving back and forth with huge tidal changes, tsunami activity, turbidity currents, really moving lots of mud and minerals, trapping and forming the majority of your fossil record during that time. Actually, from the time Noah got on the ark and by the time he got off the ark, it was over a year in length. We tend to miss that if we don't pay close attention, right? Why so long? We can only assume to accomplish God's purposes of destroying both people outside the ark and, of course, the world itself. And so people say, okay, well, that makes sense. But then wait, if there was a global flood, then where did the water from the flood go? Which is an intriguing question because how much of the earth right now is covered by water? 
Yeah, it's like roughly 70, 75 percent, right? And actually right now, if you were to press down the mountain ranges and raise up the ocean bases, right now the entire earth would be covered by two miles of water. Plenty of water just now in deeper post-flood ocean basins. And then why do we find marine creatures fossilized on mountaintops all over the world, fossilized on the mountaintops of the Himalayas, the Alps, the Rockies, even fossilized marine creatures on top of Mount Everest, we find fossilized clams in the closed position. They're buried quickly, rapidly on top of Mount Everest and other mountains. How'd they get there? I mean, last time I checked, clams don't climb that well. Right? Well, the Bible seems to imply how the flood ended in Psalm 104. Towards the end of the flood, the mountains rose up and the valley sank down. As the mountains rose up, they carried with them the newly formed fossil record from the flood event. As the valley sank down, the waters were softened to these newly formed, deeper post-flood ocean basins, leaving huge erosional marks on the continents around the globe, which if you fly at all, you've seen those erosional marks globally. And some would say, well, okay, that makes sense, but then what about the idea of Pangea, you know, one major supercontinent? That broke apart. Well, the Bible seems to imply that as well. And a creationist actually thought of the idea first, by the way. But Genesis 1.9 says this. In creation week, let the water be gathered to one place. So technically, if the water is in one place, that implies the land is in one major place. One major continent or supercontinent. Maybe something like Pangaea or Rodinia. What happened to that original supercontinent? The answer is the flood. The fountains of the great deep cause continental sprint as opposed to the idea of continental drift. And just by the way, if you do the math, long, slow, gradual processes only do not produce enough energy at one time to move tectonic plates. You want to move those, you need a catastrophic process that generates a lot of energy like when the fountains of the great deep burst forth. And we seem to see the scars of this event all around the globe. Here's a mid-oceanic ridge, goes around the earth like a baseball seam. And of course, there are fault lines all around the world. When those move today, we get volcanic activity, earthquake activity, tsunami activity. But those are just dim leftovers from that major event roughly 4,400 years ago. And to give us a better biblical picture of what that event may have been like, let me show you a video which is at the Creation Museum called The Flood Initiation. Not your normal presentation of Noah's Ark and Flood, right? And you think that might scare my kids half to death. Well, maybe, but it does get across the point of the flood. Bear in mind, it was a global judgment on man's sin. That should be, in a sense, a scary thing. But also don't miss that we see God's salvation also on display during that event as well. And by the way, did anybody else look at the screen up here and see the beautiful flower as the world's being destroyed and be conflicted about that? Was that just me, my ADD kicking in? Anyway. Uh, but I was like, wow, pretty flower and the world's being destroyed. But anyway, all right. And so 
Uh, but uh, yeah, and so after the flood is over, of course, Noah and his family, Amos, get off the ark, and God tells Noah and his kids to refill the earth, and they get right on that. And Noah's son, Shem, he has a son, and he names his son Arphaxad. And I just have to ask, who does that to their kid? <laughs> Arphaxad, really? But anyway, uh, don't you know that one day little Arphaxad is going to be with Grandpa Noah? He's going to be asking his grandpa, hey, Grandpa, where are all the other people? Why are we the only people on this planet? And of course, Noah will tell him about that great flood. And they're going to talk about that event for a really long time. It's intriguing. Shem, our fact, Sad's daddy, lived long enough after the flood to talk about that event directly to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They could have had that conversation and he lived through it. So they could have passed it on. And then after the flood, about 100 years later, it's the Tower of Babel. After the Tower of Babel, cultures begin to develop around the world. And there's different cultures that are going to pass down these legends of a global flood. And these legends get marred over time. But this is why we find over 300 flood legends all around the world that sound a whole lot like Genesis. They're just literally everywhere. I'll give you a couple of quick examples for the sake of time. There's this one over in Hawaii that says this. Long after the death of Kunihana, the first man, the world became a wicked, terrible place to live. And there was one good man left. His name was Nu'u. I bet you can figure out who that is. And it says, Nu'u, he made a great canoe with a house on it. He filled it with animals. The waters destroyed the earth, killed everybody else. Only Nu'u and his family were saved. Sounds pretty familiar, right? Or over in China, they have what's called the Haiking Classic. It tells the story of Fuhai, the father of their civilization. And it says that Fuhai, his wife, their three sons, their wives, those eight people survived a global flood and then repopulated the world. Again, it sounds very familiar. And speaking of ancient Chinese culture, look at this old Chinese dialect where they would take multiple symbols, combine those to make other words. Look at the three symbols they combined to make their word for boat. Vessel, eight people. Where did they get that from? And there are really other, some really amazing correlations to the old dialect and the history of Genesis. You can research that later on if you would like. But then after the flood was the perfect time for an ice age. <laughs> Who remembers the, the saber-toothed squirrel, right? It's kind of old now, but yeah. Um, and there was definitely an ice age covering a large portion of the Earth's land surface with snow and ice. But here's the, uh, the thing. To get an ice age requires a weird combination of environmental events. To get an ice age, you need warm ocean waters to cause much evaporation, to get all that moisture into the sky. But then you need cooler continents, cooler land masses, and cooler summers for that moisture to come down and accumulate in a form of snow and ice. So to get an ice age, you need warm oceans, cool continents. That's a really weird combination to get, but that's exactly what you would have post-flood. Because the fountains of the great deep bursting forth, that subterranean water closer to the mantle will be very warm. Then all the volcanic activity pouring lavas into the oceans, they'll be very warmed up. And then because of the volcanic activity, you're shooting dust and aerosols into the sky, thus blocking sunlight all around the globe. As a result, you get cool continents, warm oceans. Exactly what you need for a post-flood ice age. And computer simulations show with post-flood can get conditions you get an ice age to come and go in really a few hundred years. And that post-flood ice age is important for a lot of different reasons. One of those is this. During the post-flood ice age, much of the Earth's water is trapped in the form of land glaciers. That will lower your ocean levels all around the world. When you lower those ocean levels, you reveal land bridges between the continents. During that time, animals, later on, people could easily migrate by foot all over the world. As the ice age recedes and the glaciers melt down, ocean levels rise back up, land bridges disappear, and certain things get trapped in certain places like kangaroos in Australia. You can see all that comes together. And then the most obvious thing we would expect to find if there was a global flood as described in God's word would be billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Did any of you guys know Buddy Davis? Do you know his song? You're thinking about it for the rest of the day, now you're welcome. All right, but anyway... And guys, this is what we find. Billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid in the water all over the earth. And people say, okay, Brian, I mean, the stuff you said makes sense. But can the Bible really explain the rock layers full of dead things? And the answer is yes. Actually, the Bible is the only right explanation. And it's so important biblically and theologically that we explain these real world observations through that biblical lens. 
See, here's a big issue that many Christians have missed over the years on this. See, the Bible says this, that God made a perfect creation. Originally, praise God, there was no death, no suffering, no bloodshed, no disease, as Ken talked about earlier, perfect creation. And of course, when Adam sinned, that brought death and suffering into God's perfect creation. And then centuries later, there was a global flood that laid down most of the rock layers and fossils we see today. That's the biblical explanation for the rock layers and fossils. And as we'll see, their features confirm that. But here's the problem. If you reject the Bible's teaching on this, the rock layers and fossils, what are you left with? Man's ideas. Remember, it's God's word versus man's on every issue. What does man say about the rock layers? Well, man says the rock layers will lay down slowly over millions of years. Watch this. Long before man ever existed and thus before sin. And in those rock layers supposedly laid down before man, before sin, we find lots of evidence of death, disease, bloodshed, brokenness. But that was around before man sinned? The Bible says that God looked down on day six and called everything very good. Friends, God would not call millions of years of death, suffering, bloodshed, cancer very good. If he did, we'd be a very good God. And by the way, if we embrace this in a real sense, we're blaming God for death instead of our sin. It was part of his original very good creation. And the guys, most important of all, if you try to squeeze millions of years into the Bible, it doesn't matter how you try, even with the best of intentions, day age theory, gap theory, progressive creation, theistic evolution, whatever, they all inevitably put death before sin by embracing millions of years. And here's the deal. If there was death before sin, then watch this. That means death is not the consequence nor the payment for sin. This just always been around, part of God's very good creation. And if death is not the payment for sin, then Jesus' death cannot and does not pay our sin debt. And we just undermine Christ's atoning work on the cross, whether we meant to or not. And friends, I tell people all the time, this is why we care so much. And I mean, we do like giving answers about rock layers and fossils, even radiometric dating and distant starlight and dinosaurs and evolution. We give answers on the social issues, yes. But our passion in giving those answers is defending biblical authority and the gospel rooted in that authority. That's what's under attack. That's why it matters. So we've got to stand on God's word on every issue. Take every thought captive, make it obedient to Christ. So let's look at the rock layers and fossils through that biblical lens. And as we look at these rock layers and fossils, bear in mind they exist in the present. And that all scientists, biblical scientists, secular scientists, they've all got the same stuff in the present. The same rock layers and the same fossils, the same radioisotopes, the same distant starlight, all observed in the present. But here's the deal. They interpret those things differently in the present. And they make different guesses about where those things came from, their origin, and thus their age, rooted in their different starting assumptions about the unseen past, rooted in their different worldviews. Here's the simple yet profound truth. If you start with the wrong assumptions, especially about unseen history, you'll likely get the wrong conclusions. And hear me, this is why some really brilliant Secular scientists can be so wrong about particular things like the age of the earth and rock layers and fossils, wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. Reminded of the story of a little boy in the doctor's office waiting with his mom in the waiting room. As they were waiting, he looked across the room and saw a very pregnant lady. So he walked to her like little boys do. And he said, excuse me, miss, but why is your belly so big? He was really little. It was okay, all right? And she kind of laughed and she said, well, I've got a baby in my tummy. He said, there's a baby in your tummy? She said, oh, yeah. He said, well, is he a good baby? She said, he's a real good baby. To which the boy responded in horror, well, then why did you eat him? <laughs> it's silly, but you get it, right? Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. Keep that thought of mind on all these issues. So let's look at these rock layers and fossils from that biblical worldview, seven C's framework. So we expect to find distinct rock layers in our world because of Noah's flood based on a principle called hydrodynamic sorting of sediment particles. If you want to impress somebody, just say that. You feel a lot smarter after you say it. All it means is that in moving water, different types of dirt will settle into distinct layers based on their size, weight, density, and circumference. 
So you can do the experiment with yourself, with your kids, if you like. You can take a jar of water, put different types of dirt in that jar, clay, sand, gravel, silt, stuff like that. You can shake the jar up, set it down. They will settle into distinct layers for you pretty quickly. That's a good kind of tangible lesson on that. You can do it with air or water. works either way. Maybe you've seen one of these before. This would be a quicker example you could show. You've got the darker particles with the lighter ones. And you turn it over and they set onto distinct layers because the darker particles are heavier than the lighter ones based on this principle. And some would say, okay, but wait, I thought it took a long time to make a rock layer. Not at all. Water, dirt, minerals, right conditions, you can make rock layers really quickly. A few recent examples in nature. Here's a ship's bell encased by rock. Here's a clock in a rock ancient clock. Here's a spark plug in a rock. Those things are not millions of years old, as you well know. Same thing with oil and coal and things like that. This refinery in Texas, they brag, we can make oil in 30 minutes. And indeed they can with heat and pressure on organic material. You can make oil in no time flat. Just takes the right conditions. Same thing with coal. You can make coal in days or weeks in the right conditions. Does not take a long time. Same thing with your gemstones. You can make diamonds and opals and all sorts of other things like that in literally hours or days. It does not take millions of years. We can make genuine diamonds in hours. Legitimate diamonds in no time flat. Or maybe you remember Mount St. Helens, which erupted back in 1980. And from that minor eruption by historical standards, it produced rock layers. Lots of rock layers, little laminated rock layers, huge rock layers. It made all these rock layers in hours. We just watched it happen. It made canyons like this one, nicknamed the Mini Grand Canyon, because it's 140 the size of the Grand Canyon with similar features to the Grand Canyon. Very steep wall, walls, side barbed canyons, very little debris at the bottom of the canyon. 140 the size. And it made that canyon in nine hours. We just watched it happen. Great observable, testable, repeatable evidence. It doesn't take a long time to make those sort of structures. What you need is a catastrophe. And if you want bigger rock layers and bigger canyons, you need a bigger catastrophe, maybe like Noah's flood described in God's word. And bear in mind, these rock layers that we're talking about are absolutely monstrous. They are huge, covering three-fourths of the Earth's land surface. Many of them cover large portions of continents, if not covering multiple continents, which just screams a global deposition. And to give you a bit more detail on this, here's a video clip from our PhD geologist, Dr. Andrew Snelling, talking about this. Evidence number three. Rapidly deposited sediment layers right across the continents. We find that everywhere we look. Look at the red wall limestone, full of fossils in the Grand Canyon. Yet the same limestone layer is found in the same position over in Pennsylvania, then over in England, and even in the Himalayas. The chalk beds, the White Cliffs of Dover, we find the same chalk beds in Europe, in the Middle East, over into Kazakhstan, we find the same chalk beds with the same fossils in Texas and the Midwestern United States, we find the same chalk beds in Western Australia. The coal beds of Pennsylvania and West Virginia are also found in, in England and Europe, right across to the Ural Mountains. So rock layers covering multiple continents with similar fossils just screams global formation, global deposition. And then the features of these rock layers scream a rapid recent formation. For example, typically when you find rock layers, they're looking like this. Stacked one on top of the other, flat like pancakes with no signs of slow erosion between the rock layers, no signs of wind erosion, no signs of soil accumulation, no topography change, just one flat on top of the other, which would indicate rapid sheet erosion between them, but nothing slow about it. And here's the problem for the evolutionists. If these rock layers were laid down slowly over long periods of time, well, this should be the norm. Evidence of big changes over time in topography, a lot of erosion, wind erosion, chemical erosion, rain erosion. It's just not there. What we see is this, one flat on top of the other. Here's my friend John Albert pointing out what's called the Great Unconformity at the Grand Canyon, which extends over multiple continents, by the way. A knife edge contact between two rock layers with no signs of any slow erosion at all. And by the way, according to secular thinking, there's a billion years of missing history between those two rock layers. And it didn't rain for a billion years? There's no topography change in a billion years? It doesn't make good geological sense. If you could cut sideways into the Grand Canyon, this is what you see. One rock layer flat on top of the other. 
No signs of slow erosion between the rock layers. And then signs of massive erosion off the top of those rock layers. Almost as if they were laid down quickly during a year-long global flood and the massive erosion off the top of those layers as the waters receded into the newly formed deeper post-flood ocean basins. And then in these rock layers, we find cool things like fossilized tracks from T-Rexes to trilobites and everything in between. We find fossilized ripples. We find fossilized raindrops. You say, that's cool, but why does that matter? Well, you know when you go to the beach, right, and you walk on the wet sand as the water comes and goes away, and you leave footprints behind you, then they turn to stone and stay there for millions of years? (laughs) No. What happens to your footprints? Man, they're gone in no time flat from usually water erosion, maybe wind erosion. They don't stick around very long. The only way to fossilize these sort of soft sediment formations is to have this mud laid down full of minerals, have the impressions made, and then bring in more mud to fill in those impressions to protect them from erosion to give them time to harden and turn to stone. It's a rapid laying down of one layer after another. It can't be slow. If it were slow, they'd be eroded in no time flat. Great evidence of a rapid formation. And then typically, as you look at these fossilized tracks, here's the trend. Typically, they go up through the fossil record, and you find the dead critter higher up in the fossil record. Like here at the Grand Canyon, my friend Dr. Snelling pointing out these trilobite tracks, and you find the dead trilobite by secular estimations a million years later higher up in the rock layers. So by their estimation, he walked for a million years and then died. Man, it's like going to the mall. That's what, that's what it feels like. <laughs> anyway, the younger generations, what's a mall? Don't worry about it. It's for Amazon. But anyway, all right. <laughs> so it doesn't make a whole lot of good sense uh, from the secular perspective. It makes sense biblically, though, while we find this, because the layers are being laid down quickly. As they're being laid down, things are trying not to get buried alive, working their way up through the mud as it's being laid down. I mean, they don't, being buried alive would be a bad way to go. But eventually they get stuck and become a fossil. Thus tracks go up, dead critter higher up, makes really good sense. Also in these rock layers, we find very little evidence of something called bioturbation. That's your big science word for today, bioturbation. All it means is life leaves a mess. And all of you know how life leaves a mess. Amen. My kids are 10 and 6 and can blow up a perfectly clean room in 2.9 seconds. Do not know how that works. But anyway, the same thing in nature. When mud layers are laid down from like a flood event or whatever scale it may be, those mud layers don't stay pretty very long. Things start digging through those layers. They're trying to find food or make new homes. And yet all over the world, we find these beautiful rock layers with no signs of bioturbation. It's like life did not have a chance to mess them up, like they were laid down too quickly during a year-long global flood. And then also these rock layers in many places around the globe, we find them, multiple rock layers all together, bent all the same direction in many mountain chains around the world, like here at the Canadian Rocky Mountains, but multiple rock layers bent all in the same direction, sometimes at almost 90 degrees of an angle, and the rock layers aren't breaking. In some cases, not even cracking. You ever try to bend a rock? I mean, rocks don't bend. So how do you have all these bent rock layers all around the world where, where it is clear that heat was not involved? Only one way to do it. Other way than, other than heat, that is. Laid out all these mud layers full of minerals pretty quickly. And while they're still soft, bend them in the same direction before they harden. And then they harden in this newly bent shape. Like we see as evidence all around the globe. Here's me at the Grand Canyon, at Carbon Canyon, the side canyon off that canyon, looking at the fold of the rock layers and there's no breaking in the fold. This is a global phenomenon. Or we find something called polystrate fossils. Poly means multiple, straight means rock layers. These are fossils that go through multiple rock layers. Now, if you believe in long periods of time, this is a really big problem. For example, this tree fossil goes through three different rock layers over in Tennessee that are supposedly separated by hundreds of thousands of years. Now, I lived in Tennessee for about 20 years. I did not see dead trees standing up for decades, or I haven't lived a century, but you know. How long do dead trees stand up? Hundreds of years? Thousands? No way, millions. 
Yet all over the world we find lots of fossils, not just trees, but many of them are trees, that go through multiple rock layers. My son found this one over in Pikeville, Tennessee, this polystrate fossil, but they're literally everywhere. Does not make sense if they're laid, these rock layers were laid down slowly. That could not happen. These rock layers were laid down quickly. Here at France, they're going through rock layers upside down, which is a really big problem for the evolutionists. These polystrate fossils are a great confirmation. These rock layers were laid down quickly, not slowly. And then... Who's ever gone to the cave before and you're told the same spiel by the guide, don't touch the formations, they took millions of years to form. Heard that before? You got the stalactites, hang on tight to the ceiling. The stalagmites are the mounds on the ground. If they grow together to form a column, that is scientifically called a column. <laughs> Makes sense, right? And it used to be suggested that it took around 100,000 years to get one cubic inch of flowstone formation. So the water comes down with the minerals, the water evaporates, leaves the minerals behind, and the minerals accumulate. But simply put, more waters, more minerals, right conditions, you can get these formations to form very quickly. A few examples of that. Underneath the Lincoln Memorial, these stalactites grew over five feet in length in less than 50 years. Very, very quick. Or over in Australia... They shut down this mine, opened it up 55 years later to a shock. Look at the slag tights and mites that grew in 55 years. Notice the miners circled for scale. Or another example, over in Wyoming, in a particular park, they're piping up the hot mineral water. So they're piping up the water on purpose. Uh, the water comes up and evaporates and leaves the minerals up behind and the minerals accumulate. If you've ever seen a uh, discoloration like this on a sink before, that is mineral accumulation. By the way, my wife makes me tell you those are not our sinks at our house. <laughs> Just for clarification, all right? So I don't get in trouble. But they're piping up this mineral water, and look what accumulated in just 100 years. That's lime. That's a lot of lime. That's going to take some lime away. I'm just saying, all right? It's a terrible joke. All right, but anyway, here's another one down the road. And I'll wrap up and move to the next section after this quote, but from Dr. Cherry Trout, who says this in his book, Caving into Reality, what geologists used to believe was fact in terms of dating a cave is now speculation. For example, from 1924 to 1988, there was a sign at Carlsbad, a famous cave system, that said Carlsbad was 260 million years old. Then in 1988, the sign was changed to read it 7 and 10 million years old. Then for a little while, the sign read it is 2 million years old. And now... The sign is gone, <laughs> which we can praise God about. And we could literally go on, but I hope you see just in this short look that actually real observations, real geology confirms the Bible's clear history in a very powerful way. Now, what about the dead things in those rock layers? What about the fossils in them? What do they point to? What do their features really point to? Long, slow, gradual processes or rapid catastrophic processes not that long ago? And as we talk about the fossil record, bear in mind this first of all. It is a record of death. It's actually a reminder of how serious God takes sin. And it's interesting, 95% of the fossil record is made up of marine invertebrates, water creatures without a backbone. Funny, why is 95% of the fossil record made up of marine creatures? I think because the fossil, fossil record was laid down by a global flood. Makes sense, right? And also bear in mind, to make a fossil requires very special conditions. Because by God's grace, when things die, this is what typically happens. There's decomposition. Scavengers eat them. Bacteria break dead things down and dead things disappear. Roadkill disappears in a few weeks. Praise God, amen? If it didn't, dead things would be piling up on our planet and that would be gross. All right? So by God's grace, it's a mechanism to get rid of those dead things. And when things die in the water, also... This is not reality. They don't typically sink slowly to the bottom, get covered by dirt, and become a fossil. That's just not reality. In reality, when things die in the water, they tend to bloat and float. But either way, scavengers eat them, they decompose, and they're gone in no time flat. An entire whale carcass will be gone in 10 years and will not fossilize unless there are special conditions at play. If you want to get a fossil, you got to do something like this. you got to sneak up on your pet fish Nemo. 
Who's having a good day in this little aquarium? Off to the side, take a bucket, put dirt in the bucket and minerals, add some water, make a form of concrete, if you will, and then dump that on Nemo. And bury poor Nemo deeply and quickly and protect him from oxygen, scavengers, and decomposition, and then he might become a fossil. Now, if there are kids in here, don't try this at home, all right? Just a bad illustration, but... The point is that has to be a rapid process, typically. We've got lots of examples of this. Here's a fossil at the museum, Creation Museum. This is a fish fossilized in the act of eating another fish, which is not uncommon, by the way. But this poor guy did not get to finish his last meal. And that's why I call this fossil the Last Supper. <laughs> Maybe not appropriate, okay. <laughs> Here's a fossilized ham. No relation to Ken Ham, by the way. <laughs> there are some jokes in there I'll leave alone. I like my job. I love my job. But no, this is a hand that turned to stone in less than 60 years after being buried from a volcanic eruption, a petrified ham. Now, what do you do with it? No clue, but there's a petrified ham. Here's an ichthyosaur fossilized in the act of giving birth. And of course, that did not take millions of years. Again, pretty much instantaneous. Well, this one's over from Georgia. Here's a dog that evidently ran up a tree and got stuck and became a fossil in roughly 20 years. Someone found him, they cut him out, put him on display, and they named the display Stucky. <laughs> Which is so funny and so sad, right? Uh -oh. And then recently scientists made fossils in a laboratory in 24 hours. And the fossils they made look pretty much identical to fossils you would find out in nature. And I could go on, but I hope you get the idea. Typically, to make these sorts of things requires a rapid process. And then a lot of these fossils, we find a lot of what I call, my own title for this, fresh fossils. You see, what do you mean by fresh? Well, take, for example, this shrimp fossil. According to secular viewpoints, this shrimp fossil is 300 million years old based on the rock layer it was found in. But notice, it's retained the fine detail of the fossil for 300 million years. It's retained the color of the shrimp over 300 million years. And by the way, when they cracked it open, the discoverer said it had a fishy smell to it, which is not actually uncommon in some cases on these marine creatures. That's what I mean by fresh. Or this squid fossil, supposedly 150 million years old, ink still fresh enough to write with from the squid. Or we do whole talks on dinosaurs. We talk about this a lot in those talks. But we're finding literally soft tissue from dinosaurs intact in their bones all over the place. This soft tissue, it's literally still stretchy. You can pull it, it'll spring back in place. Oftentimes there are blood vessels and red blood cells still intact in this tissue. And friend, those organic remnants, which are made of mostly water like our flesh, they should not last hundreds of years after the creature's death. Maybe thousands, no way millions. Great confirmation of the biblical time scale. And then these fossil graveyards in which we find these fossils, they're typically huge, covering typically thousands, about thousands of square miles, covering three-fourths of the Earth's land surface. And in these fossil graveyards, you're finding millions, in many cases, billions and at least in one case, you're finding close to a trillion things buried together in catastrophic fashion from different ecosystems buried in contorted death poses. Friends, how do you bury billions of things together catastrophically? I think you need a global flood. And guys, there is no process in the present forming the sort of fossil graveyards that formed in the past. Something very different happened in the past. It's called Noah's Flood. And some would say, okay, Brian, but then where are all the human fossils? Well, they're actually right where we expect them to be. And so you find a general order with the fossils in the fossil record. You've got marine creatures and the fish, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. But bear in mind, they're marine creatures all the way through. And they're 95% of all the fossils. But there's a general order. And this general order is probably mostly related to mobility for the creatures and then the habitat where these creatures live in elevation. Note the order. Bottom sea dwellers. Fish, amphibians, water and land, reptiles, land and water, mammals, highlands. And so things that lived in higher ecological systems are buried last. And think about it. During the flood, humans are smart and mobile. As the waters are rising, what do humans do? 
And we're running for high ground, right? When high ground runs out, we are swimming. When that, if we get tired, we're grabbing something that floats. Here's the point. Because of our mobility and intellect, for most people at the time, most likely, they're going to, be avo- they're going to avoid being catastrophically buried. If they're not catastrophically buried, they don't fossilize. And that's why don't, we don't find that many human fossils, most likely. We find a few thousand in the upper layers, if you will call them that, which is a great confirmation of the biblical worldview, a huge problem for the evolutionists because according to evolution, humans have been around in our modern form for roughly 200-ish thousand years. And we've been burying our dead to one degree or another for that period of time. If that were the case, hear me, there should be billions of easily discoverable human fossils. We find just a few thousand. Makes sense within the biblical worldview. And then also as we talk about this, we've got to mention this. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Praise God we don't see this happening today. Amen. These transitioning forms, kind of intermediates from one to another. On the top left-hand corner, we don't see the crog, the crocodile frog. Next to it, the literal bird dog. <laughs> All right. The banana fish, which you cannot unsee, by the way. <laughs> All right, you got the great white horse in the middle there. Don't ride that. That's a bad idea. Underneath that, you got the squillosaurus or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> That'd be my son's favorite, most likely. But <laughs> we don't see things transitioning from one kind to another. Now, to be fair, if there was an evolutionist up here with me, they would say, but Brian, you're being silly. They would argue Evolution happens too slowly that you can't see it happening. Which I would suggest is convenient. And I'll still push back and say, but if it does happen at all, shouldn't there be some observable change and transition from, you know, if something goes from like a cow to a well, or at least in features from a, a lung to a gill or from a leg to a wing, something intermediate? We don't see that. All we see are fully formed creatures doing what they were designed to do. But let's say you give them all that. Let's say you can't see it happening, but we say, okay, well, at least for the moment, we'll, and we'll go with your idea that it did happen in the past. If it did happen in the past, then where should the evidence be? It should be in the fossil record, right? There should be at least millions, if not billions, of these clear intermediates going from single-celled organisms to fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, humans. There should be millions of these clear transitions, and friends, they're just not there. And the honest evolutionist knows it. I'll give you a couple of quotes to drive this home. Charles Darwin understood this well. And he wrote in his book, The Origin of Species, if my theory is true, why is in every geological formation, every rock layer full of intermediate leaks, links? Geology, the rock layers, don't reveal this. And this is the biggest objection that can be used against my theory. He understood the problem really well. So what was, what was the answer to the problem? He said this, well, I believe it lies in the extreme imperfection of the geological record. In other words, we've not dug in the dirt enough. If we keep digging, then we'll find all these transitions that confirm my theory. Which, by the way, that is a prediction that is scientific. That's a good thing. The question is this, how did the prediction fare? Well, we are over 250 years past Darwin. We have over 250 million fossils in museums around the world currently. And David Rump, one of the greatest paleontologists, fossil experts of the 20th century, and definitely not a creationist, he very honestly said this. Knowledge of the fossil record has been greatly expanded in context since Darwin's time. Ironically, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transition than we had in Darwin's time. Darwin said, we don't have the transitions. David Rom says, we have less than what Darwin had. Not a good argument for evolution. And then you can put fossils in one of two major categories, either critters that went extinct or critters similar to those living today. Some of those are called living fossils. And so, for example, if you find a fossilized wasp, supposedly 35 million years old, looks like wasp you'll find flying around today or at least to be flying around soon in the spring. Find a fossilized coelacanth fish, supposedly 66 million years old. Looks like coelacanths you'll find still swimming around today. Find a fossilized jellyfish, supposedly 400 million years old. Looks like jellyfish you'll find today. Same thing with your sharks and turtles and ferns and so forth and so on. No change in general from past to present. Interesting. 
Although there is one change that the evolution, evolutionists don't talk about much because in a sense it will be de-evolution. And that is, for some creatures, their ancestors were much bigger than their modern day counterparts. They're getting smaller over time, not bigger and better. So in a sense that would be de-evolution, so it's not a popular thing to talk about, but there's some good examples of it. For example, here's a fossilized dragonfly with a 50 inch wingspan. Do not hit that while riding your bike, <laughs> all right? Or we get big roaches today. <laughs> wow, <laughs> don't like roaches, I get it, okay. Get ready. We have found some fossilized roaches over 18 inches long. <laughs> she will need a bigger broom. Just saying. <laughs> we have found fossilized centipedes over 8 feet long. Fossilized millipedes over 10 feet long, bigger than a car. Fossilized rhinos over 18 feet tall, kangaroos 10 feet tall, wombats the size of a mini cooper. Fossilized quote unquote guinea pigs that weighed roughly 1,500 pounds. It's a big rodent. Speaking of big rodents, we found fossilized rats with estimated to be four feet tall, 10 feet long, weighing 10,000 pounds. Discovery Channel called them Ratzilla, rightfully so. Seems like a really bad sci-fi movie, doesn't it? We found fossilized crocodiles 40 feet long, beavers 6 feet long, big turtles in South Dakota and other places too. And I'll do one more just for the sake of time. You base the size of a shark based on the size of its teeth. And based on the teeth of Megalodon, uh, Megalodon got to be maybe roughly 60 to possibly 80 feet in length. And Megalodon's teeth are similar to that of a great white shark. So the Megalodon was likely the great white's great, 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 great granddaddy. And we can be glad these megalodons, at least these big sharks of sorts, are not around today as far as we know. <laughs> that would be a problem. And friends, we could literally just go on for what might feel like millions of years, all right? But I hope you're seeing that the features of the world around us, these rock layers and fossils scream, God's word is true. And it's right about everything. It's right about history. It's right about the present. It's right about the future. Put your faith in Christ. And I'm telling you what, when people see this, especially kids, it makes the Bible come alive. It's connected to my life in a real tangible way. It is the authority on historical issues, on moral issues, on salvation issues. And that's really what we're aiming for here. And we go through all this and you say, okay, Brian, you went through all that really quickly. You make it seem pretty obvious. But if it is so obvious, then how come so many smart people today miss such clear evidence? Well, bear in mind, many smart people don't. There are many smart Christians who are doing good science rooted in a biblical worldview. And actually, pretty much every branch of science was started by a Bible-believing Christian. Kind of cool when you think about it. But why do some smart people miss it today? The answer is this. Because ultimately, dear friends, all of this stuff, it's not a head issue. It's a heart issue. That then becomes a worldview issue as a result. I'll give you an example of this. We'll wrap up. There are canyons on Mars at least one of which is bigger than the Grand Canyon, as far as we can tell, which is really neat. So the question is, when did it form? How did it form? How long did it take? And so forth. According to secular scientists and science journals, they said these canyons on Mars, one of which is bigger than the Grand Canyon, formed in a few weeks. Wait. I thought according to you, that took millions of years. How, pray tell, did they form so quickly? A direct quote. A flood of biblical proportions. <laughs> carved an instant Grand Canyon on Mars. Well, friends, realize they are willing to believe in a flood of biblical proportions on a planet, Mars, with little or no liquid water presently. They refuse to believe in a flood of biblical proportions on Earth, which is currently covered by roughly 70% water. How can they be so blind? Well, because a PhD, which is not a bad thing, it's a good thing, but a PhD doesn't change a person's heart. Ultimately, it's not a head issue, it is a 
heart issue, that then becomes that worldview issue. And the Bible tells us as much. So many verses we could go to. One example, 2 Peter 3, verses 3 through 7. I'll summarize for the sake of time. It says, in the last days, since Christ ascended and before he returns, scoffers will come. And they will scoff against God and his word. They will say, where is his coming that he promised? Notice, for everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Long, slow, gradual, natural processes. They don't allow for anything supernatural. And it goes on to say this. These scoffers will deliberately reject out of hand three key biblical truths before even looking at the world at all. What are they? The creation and the flood and the coming judgment. Why? Because if those things are true, and friend, hear me, they are. Here's what it means. God made us. In his image, as Martin talked about so well earlier, we are accountable to him. He has judged the world in the past. He'll judge the world again in the future. And sinful man doesn't like that idea. So what do we do? Romans 1, suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Not a head issue, it's a heart issue. And that's why we so encourage uh, Christians that we are striving to equip with these answers. We don't just stop with the answers. We love the answers. Yes, show the Bible is true. Don't stop there though. Get to the answer, Jesus Christ, which changes their heart, which will change their thinking and change their worldview. And what the fossils really do cry out, God's word is true. God judges sin, but has made a way of salvation. And what a beautiful picture in the ark. Think about it. It was a global righteous judgment on man's sin with one way to be saved. Through the door of the ark. Picture of Christ. Because there's another global judgment coming. The next time is by fire and for eternity. And there's one way to be saved. Jesus said, I am the door. If by me any man enter in, he shall be saved. And of course, you can see what we're doing here at the end. Something you guys know all too well. We're getting to the gospel. We talked about rock layers and fossils that gave answers. We did apologetics. We defended the faith to get to the answer, Jesus Christ. So that those that we speak to, especially these precious children, but also your friends and your family, co-workers, people you mingle with in your life, you can share this truth, share the gospel, that God might work through that to change them from the inside out for his glory and, of course, for their good. And that really is our passion, defending biblical authority to proclaim the gospel effectively. And I really mean it. We count it such a privilege to hopefully pour into you as you pour into these precious lives under your care. We pray that God does mighty things as you use this stuff and all this information and your wonderful personalities to his glory in the lives of these kids and the people around you.